Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of the Michigan Environmental Justice Conference. Uh, glad to see a lot of you back in. We've got uh, 128 people signed in for this session right now, and many more are jumping on as I speak. I did have a poll up just to kind of gauge how many people have been attending the rest of the sessions uh, we've had last three days, because since this is day three, uh, and I will share the results with you, as you can see. And, you know, we got a lot of people. This is the first session of the day uh, or the, of the conference, which will make my housekeeping remarks uh, very fresh because a lot of you have seen these same things um, over and over again. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so my name is Jim Ostrowski and I work with in the Environmental Support Division of Eagle. And I'm just going to go through a few things before I hand it over to Katie. Uh, first of all, lines are muted and we are recording the webinar. Uh, all recordings are posted on the website for the event. You can find them all there. The ones from yesterday should be posted as well. Fiona asks a question and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. Um, if we can't, uh, we do have them all recorded. Uh, you can submit them using the Q&A box in your Zoom toolbar. Also, you can use the Whova app. And in Whova, you can submit your questions there or add chat messages and check out other interesting uh, things related, related to the conference. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katie. Katie, go ahead. Thanks, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Katie Cruz. I'm the Environmental Justice and Tribal Liaison for the Office of Environmental Justice Public Advocate in Michigan's Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. I know that one's a mouthful. Um, so we ended last night's session talking about the importance of having all voices at the table and an all hands on deck approach to move us towards environmental justice, which I think is a great segue to today's session this morning, looking at environmental justice at the local level. So we have, if our presenters want to turn their cameras on, um, we have Allison Sutter, who is the Sustainability and Performance Manager Officer with the City of Grand Rapids. She is also a member of our Michigan Advisory Council on Environmental Justice. We have Missy Stoltz, who is the Sustainability and Innovations Manager at the City of Ann Arbor, and Scott Benson, Detroit City Councilman. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Allison to start us off. All right. Well, thank you, Katie. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here this morning uh, with my colleagues for this presentation. I'm going to go ahead and bring up my slides, and I'm going to move relatively quickly through this, but they will be shared. So can I get a thumbs up? Are the slides looking good? Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in, but um, I was asked to tee this up a little bit from a broader perspective. And before I start, I wanted to remind myself to step back for a minute and acknowledge my privilege as a white person who has been or who was born in the United States. And that's not a privilege that I take lightly. Um, and it is something that I'm, I'm personally using, particularly in the space of environmental justice to help um, advocate uh, in partnership with many of my black and brown and indigenous uh, friends and colleagues in our community. So I really uh, just wanted to own that up front. So I wanted to um, start off and frame the way that I think about, I've been in city government for three and a half years. And so for me along my sustainability professional journey, but as I've also learned in studying about the city of Grand Rapids and our journey on the left-hand side of this chart, it's really talking about environmental sustainability, natural resource protection or climate change, which I think has been the focus of the planet. And when I think about people's journey in this space, I think most organizations and institutions started in this space, right? How are we conserving land, protecting air, protecting water? Uh, personally, I really think that our climate change movement went off the rails when professionals wanted to talk about polar bears in the Arctic, right? We have people dying in our community from climate change and it's predominantly our black and brown residents and people are talking about polar bears in the Arctic. So personally, I think that that's a, a little bit where we've gone off the rails. And I'm thankful that there's been um, kind of this energy and this movement around equity, diversity, and inclusion more broadly 
broadly across institutions in the countries. I know a lot of individuals who are on this call and people who have been on this journey for quite some time and doing extraordinary work in this space have been doing it for a while, but I think more broadly now institutions and organizations are, are embracing and embedding equity, diversity, inclusion, or what could be called social responsibility and really thinking about people. How are we engaging people, thinking about people's health, thinking about people's opportunity, wealth accumulation, wealth building. And so for me, the, the intersection of those two in my profession is where I focus with environmental justice and climate justice. And I've been very adamant that we need to be leading with the health of people and putting the health of people above the health of our planet. But of course, it's it's a complex situation because oftentimes, you know, when our planet and our environments are sick, that's having a direct impact on our people as well. So second, I come and, and this morning's conversation is about local government institutions, and I appreciate being invited to the to the state conversation in this space. Um, you know, I think historically cities have operated uh, predominantly with white people sitting in city hall, going out to the community saying, climate change is a bad thing and it's affecting people of color and you should do X, Y, and Z. Um, and that's really not the appropriate approach to take. It's not one that's leading with equity. And understandably, it's not been one that has been successful because we've continued to see disparate outcomes um, in our BIPOC communities across our, across our city. And, and that's very true for the city of Grand Rapids as well. And so really pushing and working in this space to get outside of the silo of city hall or city government and being very intentional about how are we partnering with the community and how are we partnering with other municipalities. Missy and I have lots of conversations about that and also partnering with the state because I do believe that local governments have you know, the best ability on the ground in the community to develop those relationships with our residents, with our community-based organizations and be a key liaison and partner to the state working on environmental justice topics. And so just a couple quick things with respect to the city of Grand Rapids. Again, I'm gonna flip through these pretty quickly. We do have a strategic plan which guides all of our work. We have six values, I think many of which are important for this, but definitely equity, sustainability, and collaboration. Uh, we start our plan out with an equity statement talking about how we are gonna lead with equity and are very specific about racial equity and leading with racial equity across all work in our state or excuse me, in our city. And so then actually the first objective in our plan is that we're gonna embed equity throughout our government operations. And that means that we're working to elevate and organize equity work across the entire city and being focused on our neighborhoods of focus. One thing that I think is really important, and this is true in the environmental justice space, we are working to disaggregate any and all data we receive, utility consumption, access to healthy green space, air quality emissions by race, separate from ethnicity, uh, gender identity, and geography to the extent possible that we can. Um, and really thinking about the, the uh, equity impacts of any major policy proposal or programs that we're doing at the city. And so the other one other section, which I'm the lead on, is to reduce carbon emissions and in, increase climate resiliency. And so here I just really want to key in on number four and five, because we are we've been focusing internal first on our own municipal operations, get our own house in order. But we also talk about creating and supporting programs and policies that will reduce carbon emissions across our entire community. And so how can we work in partnership? Our entire community, less than 5% of carbon emissions come from city operations. So if we truly want to be effective in this space, we have to be partnering with our residents and sorry, with our residents and with our um, organizations. And we also state that we're going to create a climate action and adaptation plan in partnership with the community. So I was asked just to explain for a minute our neighborhoods of focus. We often refer to them as our NOF. We had a grant from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. We have 47 census tracts in the city of Grand Rapids and 17 of those which make up 36% of our census tracts. They all fall in our Ward 1 and our Ward 3. Um, and this is where our highest percentage of BIPOC live in our community. Um, and due to systemic and historic inequities, the residents in our NOF are experiencing the most disparate outcomes compared to any other Grand Rapids census tract. And that's looking across the board, whether it's income, wealth accumulation, educational attainment, and health. 
And so we've been very specific and been fortunate to, that we had this data and this analysis done. And so across our entire city budget, we are working department by department to say, what work are you doing and how are you being intentional about investing money into our neighborhoods of focus? And so now I just wanna take a minute to wrap up my section of the presentation to highlight one of the key ways in which the city of Grand Rapids is working to collaborate with our residents and our neighborhoods specific on climate justice. And so I have the opportunity here today to present on behalf of a very diverse group um, of stakeholders across our city on what we call our community collaboration on climate change, which is also called C4, um, where we have made strides that for our um, leadership council, we will have 50% BIPOC and it will include at least one person who is Black or African American, one of Asian Pacific Island descent, um, one that is Indigenous or um, from our native populations and also one that is from our Latinx populations. And we are laying out an infrastructure that says when decisions are made, 33% of the people sitting at that table have to be BIPOC in order for us to actually have a vote and have a decision that's made. And so the way we start off, we always have a land acknowledgement and really want to just acknowledge that, we, that in Grand Rapids, where I'm sitting today, I'm on the beautiful ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe people, and that we recognize the sovereignty of Michigan's indigenous nations and historic communities, both those that are here now and those that were forcibly removed. And really just want to express gratitude and appreciation to our indigenous peoples who have really been leading with all of this in the core of protecting people and the environment um, at the heart of a lot of the work that we're doing and many things that we can learn um, from our indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, with respect to, we also really wanted to own through this process, it was going on during COVID, it was also going on during um, the Black Lives Matter and Moving Me and Cosecha movements that were happening, and we had real conversations with our members to say, is this the appropriate time to be working on this? Is this top of mind? There are some big, heavy issues taking place in the community that are, that are very important to our BIPOC colleagues. And, and at the time, the team did say, yes, this is important. Doing this work is important. So we continue um, to do that work throughout that time. So very quickly here, the problems that we identified as a group to work on, you know, BIPOC are more disproportionately negatively impacted. That's been repeated throughout the con conference. Uh, BIPOC are not authentically or consistently represented in this movement. Um, and currently our city lacks a solid and stable infrastructure really to challenge the systemic barriers necessary to make these bold changes. We recognize that climate change is both urgent and long-term and that the lack of awareness and understanding with respect to the heavy scientific climate change work as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion is a problem. And so the solutions really mirror the problems and how do we provide resources directly to our community and to our activists of color? How do we redefine our values and our resources for a give and take relationship and not just a give, or excuse me, not just a take relationship? You know, how do we leverage a stronger network of organizations? And then also, you know, addressing the urgency of this issue, but also recognizing it takes a lot of time to build trusted relationships with people of color when, when rightfully so, they don't often have trust in city, local city government. And then increasing the awareness and understanding of both climate change, but also diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this is the vision statement that our C4 created that black indigenous and people of color and historically white environmental organizations will dismantle extractive systems and build new systems to address climate change. And we're gonna center human well-being, the interconnectedness of life and access to shared leadership. And so I won't go through all of the values here, but I think it's important that we did create values and we also created community benefit or excuse me, community agreements where we all come to every meeting and have the expectation that all anyone participating at any level adhere to these values and, and commit to holding these values for making decisions. And a few that I just really wanna talk about, right? Dismantle injustice. That is a value that we hold core to the work that we're doing, sharing leadership. Um, and cultivating belonging. 
And so we created a budget, a three-year budget to launch this initiative. And really what I wanted to highlight here is again, we're working to shift power and who gets to make the decisions and who is at the table, as I mentioned, ensuring that our BIPOC colleagues are at the table and influencing those decisions, but also directing the majority to the extent possible of the funding that we, rece that we receive to BIPOC residents and also to BIPOC organizations or businesses in our community. And so while we did put aside a lot of funding for community engagement events, we actually line itemed a specific amount of BIPOC engagement events where money will go to be organized by BIPOC organizations for our communities of color, where they have space to be able to think about and receive information the way that they want from trusted partners, from the people they want to, which likely might not be the city, um, and from others to then be able to come back think about it, have dialogue, and ultimately come back to not only the city, but also those white dominant environmental grassroots organizations and say, this is our climate agenda. This is what is important to us. We want to work on this. And so that's going to take some time um, to do that. So here, the main point that I wanted to um, share here is we really embedded and changed the process by which um, all of this work is happening. And one of the biggest things is this hero to host, right? And moving from what I think is a white dominant culture to come in and say, well, I'm here and I'm gonna work on environmental justice and I'm gonna lift up you know, community and, and work on this and I know everything and I'm the expert and I'm gonna make it good. Um, for BIPOC residents in our community. And really to say, you know, for a lot of reasons, that's the wrong approach, set that aside and, and, not, and don't be the hero. Instead, be the host. How, you know, as a white person, am I serving to provide a platform for leadership opportunities um, and for my colleagues of color to be the ones to drive and have the opportunity to make the decisions, to have the power and to have the money. And what am I doing to help shift and not be a hero, but shifting to hosting a safe space for people who feel welcome to do that and are able to have success in that space. So my last slide um, are some lessons learned through this process that I think are really valuable and important. First, slow down, right? I came in thinking six months, we're gonna crank this out. We're gonna create a grant application. It'll be awesome. No, it's two years later and it's still a lot of work. And I, you know, right, I have a lot of climate change groups in my community that are saying, you need to be doing something now. And I'm saying, yes, I understand the urgency of climate change, but we have to slow down. If we're authentically going to lead with equity, we have to take the time to build trusted relationships. And that's not three months, right? I venture to say from start to beginning, it's at least two to three years to build that in to develop those relationships. And so be prepared and think about that. And we have to be okay with that tension of wanting to go fast, but needing to slow down. Um, you really have to have the right people at the table from the very beginning, right? Think about how you would feel if you got invited to the table after the main policy decisions, the goal and the vision were already set. You're coming in feeling like, well, what do I really have the opportunity to influence? And again, we had to push pause because our original group of participants only had 25% BIPOC. We said that doesn't represent our community. They pushed back and said, we don't have everybody at this table that needs to be at this table. Our group said, okay, you're right. So we brought on more of our um, residents of color onto the table, but you know, it was a misstep. We should have had them there from the very beginning. So really take the time and intentionality before you even start brainstorming what you think something's gonna look like to have the right people at the table. You know, we've talked about it a lot here, but be prepared for uncomfortable conversations. You know, we provided a safe space for those uncomfortable conversations and we want people to lean in and be able to have those because that's where you have the most growth and the best outcomes. You know, identify and share your structural barriers. You know, we really started to run into and identified issues in the philanthropic community. Well, we can't grant grants to X organization because of X, Y, and Z and IRS. And so we went back and wanted to own and say, that's an obstacle, but we also shared with the philanthropic community, you're a part of systemic racism because of X, Y, and Z, right? Will you work on this with us? Be transparent at all times with everything to the extent you can. Um, and then just acknowledge, we have to work on acknowledging the complexity of this work. We've been doing it for two years. It's very rich, it's very complex, and we wanna bring along everyone else, but they haven't had the opportunity to be with us for two years. And so we just have to acknowledge that that's complex and there are some dynamics with that and how do we help bring others on our journey. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing um, and turn it over to my colleague.
All right, Ms. Suter. Thank you very much for that and great information. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I want to talk briefly about the connection of the legislation as in legislators and environmental justice at the city level. So my name is Councilman Scott Benson and I represent the Northeast side of Detroit, uh, the third district. Um, I've been working on environmental justice and social justice through the Green Task Force since I was elected in 2013. The former councilman, Kim Cockrell, who was resi not resigning, but uh, did not run for office again in 2013, suggested that I would be a good steward of the Green Task Force. And I was excited to take this over and take this on. Um, we had a long history in sustainability, uh, social justice, environmental justice, and working in the community in the nonprofit sector during real estate development. So it was something very exciting to take on. And when you typically think of Detroit, you don't think of environmental justice. So we had the opportunity to sit down, take the Green Task Force, and look at what we were doing as a city and how we could change the narrative. Detroit has a long, rich history of environmental justice, but we don't have a history of the city supporting and being engaged in trying to solve problems. So this was an opportunity to take the practitioners, take the advocates, as well as industry, and sit them down at one table and try to push legislation, try to set policy, and try to solve problems in the city proper. And so we've been very successful at and had an opportunity to make to move the needle uh, in several ways. So when we look at our green task force, we've established a number of subcommittees. So we have our climate action subcommittee. We have our energy waste reductions uh, subcommittee now, and we're looking to be working on our benchmark marking ordinance to the energy waste reduction subcommittee. We're looking at our organic recycling, and we've moved the needle when it comes to organic recycling. We've now seen the city start to sell um, spaces in city-owned land to um, practitioners who are now doing organic recycling and composting in the city of Detroit at scale, something we hadn't seen until recently in the city. We have our recycling and waste reduction, and we've uh, actually established the benchmark where we're trying to get to 40% curbside recycling participation in the city of Detroit, and we're trying to increase our diversion rate to 20%. Um, for our solid waste in the city of Detroit, places we've never been. And so the city started a pilot recycling program, curbside recycling, I want to say back in 2011. In 2014, we actually established a citywide recycling program, and our rates were pretty anemic initially. But we've been able to grow our recycling participation curbside rates from the 5% mark in 2015 and now we're looking at 35% recycling participation rate in the year uh, 2021. So in six years, we've been able to significantly increase participation rates when it comes to recycling at the curbside level. We also have our renewable energy uh, task force, and we're really looking at uh, solar and how do we produce more solar participants um, and in more rooftops in the city of Detroit using solar and renewable energy. And that means we have to work with partners like DTE at the table um, to get them to get their buy-in and to get more support there. And so and typically what you find is that when we have our advocates and our practitioners, there's typically a, a, a let me see, a, a natural conflict there. But when you have people at the table able to talk, it changes the dialogue and it changes the narrative. And we're often able to find out how we can come to a, um, a, a rational, reasonable, and sustainable solution to the issue. And so right now we're moving the needle, uh, we're working with DTE, we're working with our solar practitioners and advocates, and I believe we're gonna have something um, that's gonna work for the city moving forward, and hopefully within the next year. Uh, we have our transportation subcommittee, as well as our water subcommittee, and that's really looking, the water side is really looking at sustainability. How do we ensure that people have access to healthy, clean, safe, and clean water? Um, in the past, it's typically been a thought that the city should be the one to provide water for free or at this kind of rate. But unfortunately, the state legislation doesn't support that. And just financially, the city can't afford to give away discounted or free water. So what we are looking at is, a, and we've been leading on this, is a national um, movement 
to have the federal government do something like they do with energy, which is the list, the live, the live heat program, which is um, low income heat energy assistance program. And we're looking to do something called this WAP, which is a low income sewerage water assistance program where the federal government would subsidize the cost of water and do that at the national level. LIHEAP takes in about $3.5 billion is what is funded annually to help support low income uh, gas and electric bills around the country. We're thinking that that number would be about 3.5 billion as well. And we're hoping to get our congresspersons on board. And with the current environment with uh, President Biden office, and with the Democrats having the Senate, we're hoping that we can get some traction. And this is something that the industry has been trying to do for decades. I've seen a resolution from, two, from 22, 2002. Um, and so we're still hoping to uh, get this moving and to actually get a national solution to low income access to water for our, our low income residents around the country. And so I just wanna talk about a couple of wins. And so when you have the legislation, the legislators on board, working with the administration. And in the city of Detroit, our charter makes it clear that there can be no um, usurpation or, or the legislators doing the administration's job. So we can't tell the administration what to do outside of ordinances, nor can we go in and do their job and they can't, then they or vice versa can't do the same thing. So this is how the city council members can work and, and hand in hand with the, with the administration to bring about solutions. And so one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest wins that we had was a company called US Ecology and they do industrial waste. Um, they take industrial waste in, they make it inert and then they ship it back out to uh, landfills. Now, the concern was that US Ecology, which is located in the city of Detroit and has been there for over 40 years, was going to be bringing in T-norm or radioactive waste from fracking um, operations around the country. And so the neighbors were rightfully very concerned. Um, Eagle, we worked with Eagle, but they didn't do a very good job when it came to notifying and noticing the community of what was going on. If you know the city of Detroit's geography, you know that we also have two cities, Highland Park and Hamtramck, which are surrounded by the city of Detroit, very unique geographic setup. But they wanted to do, and not wanted to, they actually did the uh, the public hearing in Hamtramck for a hazardous waste facility in the city of Detroit. Um, they didn't do it in any other languages. They, Hamtramck has a large Arabic speaking population as well as a Bengali speaking population. And many um, Eastern European uh, Polish uh, is spoke, spoken there as well. And so they didn't do any other languages. They had a the city of Detroit issue that was had a public hearing in Hamtramck. And so the residents were rightfully upset. The residents wanted to have the facility shut down. The city doesn't have that uh, right legally. We could not do that. They have been there for 40 years and they were within their proper zoning district. But what we could do is utilize the legislative process and negotiate a host community agreement with U.S. Ecology, which is what we did and we did that successfully. So the community had 13 demands. The 13th was that we would shut them down. Couldn't do that. So we were successfully able to get 12 to 13 demands agreed upon by U.S. Ecology and their commitment by contract to not bring um, T-norm or radioactive waste into our community and send trucks out of a, not into the neighborhood and send them out through a brand new, newly constructed uh, class A road to accommodate uh, truck traffic away from our neighborhood. So very successful. And immediately following that agreement on the host community agreement, USC College went back to the state of Michigan and changed the law so that they would be able to bring in T-norm throughout the rest of the state. And so we are the only location in the state of Michigan that's protected against having any T-norm brought into that facility. That's a direct result of the legislator working with the administration and the community to protect uh, their health, safety, and welfare. Something we're very proud about in that community. And uh, U.S. Ecology is required to have meetings with the community quarterly to let them know what's going on, if there have been any problems, and there are severe fines if they break that host community agreement. And so while they were able to go to Lansing and change the law of how they were able to operate around the state, because we have a contract with them, that doesn't, that, that's not established with us. We supersede that state law because we now have a contract and, and fines that are associated with that as well. So a big win there. Um, the Green Task Force has been able to be supportive and establish a greenhouse gas ordinance in the city of Detroit. And so we are now benchmarking our greenhouse gas emissions and by ordinance, we're required to assess our greenhouse gas emissions 
within the city of Detroit. And this is to bring us in line with the Paris Accords. And there's like, and initially there was tons of pushback from the administration on having to implement this and bring it in, but we were able to work. Our advocates came out, our practitioners came out, and we were able to uh, come to agreement, write an ordinance that the city could comply with and move forward and be a leader um, in, in the way of greenhouse gas ordinances and maintaining and monitoring our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we also have our other current work in environmental justice. Um, the, the Green Task Force has established a climate action committee and is working with the Office of Sustainability in the city of Detroit. And that's on the administration side. And so in 20, I want to say it was 16, the city of Detroit established this Office of Sustainability and Director um, Joel Harani here is, who I believe has spoken in a few of the uh, sessions um, during this conference, is leading that way. And we're able to work with the administration now. Our practitioners have direct access to the city uh, resources, and we're able to partner on to create community-led equity and engagement strategies. And we ensure that we include people of color who live in the most vulnerable areas. And so one of the things that we often see uh, when it comes to environmental justice is that the language, the narrative, and the message is often geared towards um, suburban white soccer moms. And so when you see the city of Detroit where you have pollution, you have truck traffic, uh, you have historic um, heavy industrial uses that directly abut residential neighborhoods that were there prior to zoning even being established. And so when you're looking at old gas stations with leaky underground storage tanks, you're looking at old chrome plating locations, you're looking at old auto factories that are right in neighborhoods. We, the low income uh, residents of color in the city of Detroit, bear the brunt um, of, of environmental ills. And so this is where it's so important to have the activists as well as your practitioners working uh, to support and ensure that we have policies that take into account their health, safety, and welfare as a priority. And so in Detroit, it's not easy, it's not hard to find um, people of color, 80% um, city of, of African Americans, um, Black people, we have a, a large uh, Latinx population, we have the second largest Bengali population um, in the country outside of uh, Staten Island, New York. And so we're able to make sure that our communities of color are at the table and our voices are being heard. And because unfortunately, we are the largest poor city in the, in the United States, that we have to ensure that we're doing policies and implementing solutions that can be implemented uh, for low income communities. And so the Office of Sustainability has, has helped come out with a community resilience toolkit and the Climate Action Committee working with the Office of Sustainability is promoting a community forums and focus groups to, uh, on climate preparedness and hosting climate preparedness events. So just some of the things we're able to do in the, environment, in the environmental justice sphere and work with the administration to bring the city of Detroit's resources to bear to help get that message out and find solutions to those type of problems. Um, to date, we have a number of accomplishments in the Green Task Force. We were able to produce marketing campaign to help re increase recycling in the city, something that we, City of Detroit, had not seen and now is just omnipresent everywhere. You see the blue containers next to our black containers throughout the city of Detroit. And we've been able to access grants where the blue containers are now free. When we started the recycling program, there was a barrier to entry, and that was a $25 cost to pay for your recycling bin. And we just weren't seeing people sign up. If you are going to make a decision to either buy a new blue recycling bin, which typically you're not thinking of recycling being a, uh, any type of benefit to you, you think of that as suburban soccer moms doing that. But when you think about it, we need to ensure that everyone is recycling because we need to take those um, uh, the solid waste products out of the waste stream and see if we can recycle as much as we possibly can. And I know people will say, well, there's some issues with recycling. There may be, but we still need to get that as a conscious and, and prescriptive uh, process in the city of Detroit. And we've been able to do that. And so we host our annual Earth Day celebration that honors our residents, as well as our practitioners and advocates who have been in the environmental justice and sustainability spheres for decades. And in the past, that was a, that was a labor of love. You were dedicated to the industry, you were dedicated to the lifestyle and dedicated to ensuring that people were educated and knew about these issues and fighting issues, but no one celebrated or recognized those efforts. And so we wanna make sure that we do that. And we host our annual Earth Day celebration every, every year. And this year we had to stop last year due to COVID, 
but this year we were able to do a outdoor um, safe distance with pro proper co um, COVID um, protocols in place and we successfully had our uh, sixth Earth Day celebration. Um, we've encouraged the city and successfully banned the purchase of styrofoam products with uh, city uh, dollars. Um, we work to encourage the city to purchase more electric vehicles and we're looking now to implement and turn over our fleet from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. And we're having our first major purchase, I believe will be within, will be before city council for approval within the month. So very excited about that as well. And working with DDOT, the Detroit, the Detroit Department of Transportation, who runs our bus service, we are now looking at changing out from internal combustion engines in our buses to electric buses and other um, fuel efficient and or natural gas vehicles as well. So we're really looking at how we're gonna move further into the 21st century and not, and at, this is a time when we have over $100 million in bonding funds where we can refresh our fleet. And so the easy way would be to go and purchase existing internal combustion engines, we have our mechanics, versus looking to the future, buying EVs and other um, vehicles that will take us into the further into the 21st century. And we can then provide a new skill set for our um, city employees and how to repair and maintain those vehicles. Um, we take every three to four years top city administrators and decision makers on site visits. We went to San Francisco um, and we've been to Minneapolis to see how those two municipalities are doing environmental and sustainability. And when we went to San Francisco, we had the great opportunity to see how the messaging and the narrative is carried out around sustainability, recycling, and just environmental justice to the communities that typically aren't um, prioritized there. And when San Francisco, I believe they have over 40 languages that are, that are spoken at a high rate in that city, and they make sure they have messaging to all those different languages and all those different communities to make sure that environmental justice and sustainability is a, a narrative on a regular basis. Um, and we have encouraged successfully to the administration to create more green infrastructure, especially non-motorized transit as well. And so just wanted to talk about what we do in the city of Detroit and why it's so important that you have legislators on board supporting as well. And not just your, um, and not just the administration, you need to have the legislators who can help set the narrative, use a bully pulpit and write ordinances and policy to help establish and move that forward. Thank you. Now I will turn it over to my colleague on this uh, panel. Thanks so much, Scott. And thanks, Allison. It's a pleasure to be on the panel with all of you. Hi, everyone. My name is Missy Stoltz. I'm the head of sustainability and innovations for the city of Ann Arbor. And I know we don't have a lot of time together, uh, so I'm going to go fast. But I do want to share that I'm coming to you from my home and uh, a renovated closet in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe and the Wyandotte peoples. And I do want to acknowledge that our city stands like almost all property in the United States on lands obtained generally in unconscionable ways from indigenous peoples. Uh, the taking of the sign was formalized by the Treaty of Detroit in 1807. And of course, knowing where we live, work, study, and recreate does not change the past. But a thorough understanding of the ongoing consequences of this past can certainly empower us in our work to create a future that supports human flourishing and justice for all individuals, which is what you heard Scott and Allison talk about in their opening remarks and the importance of this work. So again, knowing that we don't have a lot of time together, I'm not going to share some slides. I just want to give a little framing and then hopefully leave uh, at least one time for one question. In Ann Arbor, we have uh, what I often call an audacious and absolutely essential goal around becoming carbon neutral as an entire community in a just and equitable way by 2030. That means all businesses, all households, the University of Michigan, the city itself. It's impossibly hard to wrap my head around some days and super inspirational other days. But achieving a just transition is going to require get all hands on deck. It requires working with all of our stakeholders. And that's one of the exciting things that I get to do. And I cannot pretend that uh, we do it right. Um, but I can say that we try to do it authentically and humbly in this landscape. So one of the initiatives I just really quickly wanted to share is emergent. One of the things we have to do as part of A20 is electrify. And we're working really hard to change how the electricity that's powering our homes, where that comes from, making sure it's clean, renewable energy that's empowering Michiganders, um, made with, with labor that's getting a, a fair, good paying wage, uh, family supporting wages. So in doing that, if we think about transitioning then our 
gasoline and our diesel and our natural gas and our propane systems over to electric is how we'll achieve carbon neutrality from the energy sector. But we live in an area with really high electric and really cheap natural gas. That's a problem. So what we're trying to do is work with one of our neighborhoods. It is one of our largest minority neighborhoods in Ann Arbor. I'm sorry, not minority, it's one of our largest BIPOC neighborhoods in Ann Arbor. It is half renter, half owner occupied, built in the same year by the same developers. The homes, there's basically two different styles of homes. And we have uh, resources that we secured to help pay for the residents to actually design what it would mean to have a safe, comfortable, healthy home that just happens to be decarbonized. And so we kicked this off on April 15th and we've been working with residents in the neighborhood. It's uh, in our community, it's called the Bryant neighborhood and it's emergent. And we have a work plan that's being created with the residents in the neighborhood that outlines all the different activities and events we wanna do. Some of them are neighborhood beautification. Some of them are potlucks. Some of them are tree plantings that we're doing together. Others are doing home audits and coming in and actually monitoring air quality. But the point of this is if we're actually gonna decarbonize in our homes, we need to use a targeted universalism approach to really center uh, our residents that have been historically hurt first and worst by climate change, by systemic racism, by the institutions and the policies that we perpetuate, often as local and state government officials. And so I'm just excited to share this project. It is emergent. I can't tell you what it's gonna look like even next week because if I'm being authentic to the co-creation process, it will change based on the needs of the stakeholders in that neighborhood. So stay tuned for more. I'll drop a link in the chat if anyone wants to follow the work that's happening in Ann Arbor around A20, which is our decarbonization plan and the work that's part of the Bryant community. So with that, I'm gonna stop because I know we only have a few more moments for questions. All right, thank you to all our speakers. It's exciting to hear the work that's going on at the local level. Um, I'm gonna just ask this, uh, I think we would have time for one question. So, um, all right, so I, I guess we have, um, maybe some of you replied to this question. <laughs> I was just gonna ask, it, it came in through Whova, but the person is asking basically, um, you know, on Tuesday's session, we mentioned someone mentioned talking about meaningful legislation, and um, this person's asking, how do we do this? How do we encourage our leaders to pass compassionate, meaningful, and just legislation when too often our leaders are afraid to be bold? And I know, Scott, you talked a little bit about um, using legislation, so I don't know if any of you have thoughts on this or any um, closing thoughts in the last two minutes that we have. So real quick, and I would love to handle this question. So thank you for that. So number one, make sure that you have and educate your, your legislators. So your city council persons, um, they can be your biggest advocates as well. And so in the Green Task Force, I'm in a great position because I have my advocates who set the table once a month, my practitioners, as well as industry. And so when it came to having the greenhouse gas ordinance, they push for that. Right now, my advocates are pushing for a benchmarking ordinance and we're currently writing that as well. We're also working on a waste reduction um, policy uh, for our large uh, events. And so if we're able to actually get this implemented and test and actually, I guess, proof concept that we may in the future look to make that the law of the land as well. But talk to your city council persons. It may, you may not think that you have a friendly voice, but unless you talk to them and engage them, and if you have one or two, and you need five out of nine votes, making, finding three more shouldn't be that difficult. And if you can show how you're actually moving the needle in our current political climate, um, this is a great time to try to push the, uh, the envelope and get things done in your municipalities and communities. And while you may not be able to do everything that Grand Rapids or Ann Arbor or San Francisco can do, if you are pushing the conversation forward and moving more protections and sustainability, then you're doing something good. And you can keep doing that down the, down the road. Hope that helps. Katie, I would just add, I, I put a little bit of a lengthy response. I just hit respond, I think, as you were reading in the, the WOVA app. So anybody who's there could probably see it. You know, I think that's an awesome question. A couple of things I would just say, you know, I think everybody needs base understanding. And so fortunately in the city, we've had equity training all the way from our, you know, our policymakers to top management. And now we're working to get all staff required to take equity training. And I don't mean one hour, I mean 24 hours worth of equity training to truly understand um, and be empowered to speak on the topic, to understand the topic, 
um, and to gauge in that section. And then I think one of the other things just I had kind of shared, but you know, for the city, we work to have equity be a value. We have an equity statement. We refer to it often and go back to that as like, this is what we're leading with. Here's the language we used. We said, we're gonna lead with racial equity. And so those are just some of the things kind of more from a city perspective with our, you know, and our, our policymakers refer to that often and we'll bring up our strategic plan and our commitment to lead with equity and how we're building it in. Even just this morning, um, our commission's uh, voting on our budget. And I heard one of the commissioners say like, I'm so thankful for the equity presentation that we did. I better understand the investments that we're making that are aligned to equity. Thank you, Allison. So we're right at the end of the session. Um, Missy, if you want to quick, any last 30 second remarks? Yeah, super fast on that. I would say a few things. One is ask advocates are really essential in this landscape for moving legislation forward for pushing on it. Uh, second is remember that every law that we have and every policy was only written by a human. It wasn't divinely ordained. So all of these things can change. And lastly, if you're not happy with how things stand, run for office because we need you. Thank you, Missy. I wish we had more time to continue this dialogue. Um, hopefully our speakers will have an opportunity to answer some more of the questions in Whova. Um, thank you everyone for your participation. I'm gonna turn it back over to Jim for just a few wrap up housekeeping. Yeah, thanks Katie and thanks everyone. It's a great discussion, good engagement on the app and uh, through the q and appreciate that. I uh, wanna remind people, don't forget to submit uh, feedback on these sessions through the Whova app, either on your phone or in your laptop. Uh, we did make some tweaks to make it easier for you to submit feedback. So you have a button in there that says rate the session. Please do that for this session. And if you attended past sessions, go back and do those too if you can, because it really helps us you know, determine you know, how we're doing and, and how you like the sessions. Uh, the next session is up at 1015. So you got a nice little half an hour break on supplemental environmental projects. Thanks everyone for joining us this morning and we'll see you soon.